welcome to the second chapter of the webinar series of the International Network of Science, Religion and Health. I am Rafael Casarin. I'm a social scientist based at the Autonomous University of Barcelona. I'm the coordinator of the network. And together with Margriera, network director, we organize this webinar series uh, for the whole semester. So the network, uh, this network is funded by the International Network uh, for the Study of Science and Belief in Society. And our aim is, is directly to foster collaboration, facilitate knowledge exchange, and provide training for researchers uh, investigating how social and cultural narratives intersect with science, religion, spirituality, and health. Today, we are very excited to have two members of the network. We have uh, Professor Stefania Palmisano, Associate Professor in the Sociology of Religion at the University of Turin, who will be moderating the webinar and introducing our presenter, Dr. Matteo Di Placido. I will leave the screen to Stefania, and I hope you will enjoy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rafael. Thank you, Mar. I'm going to start. So, hello, hello, everybody, and welcome to this webinar entitled Yoga, Science and Health, the Social and Discursive Construction of the Yoga Body. Today's speaker is Matteo Di Placido, whom I shall introduce in a moment. First of all, I am Stefania Palmisano. I am a sociologist of religion at the University of Turin. I teach the sociology of religion and also the sociology of religion and contemporary spiritualities. Um, before starting the presentation, I'd like to thank the leaders of the International Network on Science, Religion and Health, and also the members who, with their scientific work and this kind of webinar, are making the participation very nice and productive. So thank you very much indeed. I'm really convinced that the relationships between religion, health, and science are among the most exciting frontiers in the sociology of religion today for the present and future of sociology. Together with my colleagues at the Department of Culture, Politics, and Society at the University of Turin, I personally contributed to this agenda with a few research projects, uh, um, and some uh, publication that I would like to review briefly before yielding the floor to Matteo. First of all, this is the right slide. Thank you, Matteo. Um, I was the PI of this project, Religions in Hospitals, Integrating Spirituality and Medicine in Care Practices, was a sociological study using qualitative methodology, and the project was funded uh, formally in 2020 by uh, a group of non-profit organizations, uh, as you can see from the slide, and also some religious communities. And its aim was to study the relationship between the religiosity, spirituality, and care in the hospital setting. And it gave rise to a series of publications and lectures, but most important, it offered the starting ground for another project. This time was an international project. Here it is, from Cured Care, Digital Education and Spiritual Assistance in Hospital Healthcare, funded by the European Commission's Erasmus Plus program. Um, cooperation for innovation and exchange of good practices was the stream we applied, and it aimed to strengthen the curricula of future professionals, I mean, uh, uh, future health professionals, I mean, uh, nurses, social workers, but also social policy experts and others in two areas, which we think it, they, they are very important, but also neglected, uh, which are spiritual care and digital literacy. So the program was uh, aimed to enforce uh, uh, these kind of competencies, uh, spiritual care and digital education. Most recently, in the framework of the relationship between religion and uh, health, uh, I was co-responsible for a joint project with the University of Padova, Padua in Italy, um, a project about Buddhism in Italy, 
uh, which consisted of uh, 300, more than 300 qualitative interviews, more than 500 questionnaires, and 14 field visits to a selection of Buddhist centers. And the aim was to study, to, to explain, to analyze uh, the position occupied by Buddhism in Italy um, within the broader religious national landscape. Um, many uh, are the most important uh, results, but I would like to focus on the practice of meditation because this practice emerged as a pragmatic, scientific, and therapeutic ensembles of practices tailored to satisfy practitioners' quest for meaning, well-being, and health. And now with Matteo, we are writing this article, Buddhist Therapeutics, the Overlapping Logics of Religion and Health in Westernized Buddhism. In conclusion, I would like to remind you of my 2020 book, Contemporary Spiritualities in Italy, um, Enchanted Words of Nature, Wellbeing and Mystery in Italy, uh, written jointly with my colleague Nat uh, Nicola Pannofin and published by Routledge. And now a recommendation, which is just a joke. If you come to Italy, uh, you might find it interesting to visit Damanur. Damanur is a Esoteric spiritual community is one of the most important in the world. And uh, it would be useful for you to read in advance this book, Jamanur, an esoteric community open to the world, published in 2023 by Pelgrim Macmillan. I now hail the floor to Matteo, um, whom uh, I shall give uh, um short bio. Matteo holds a PhD in sociology and social research at the University of Milano, Milano Bicocca. He is a, a cultural sociologist and currently works as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Turin. And Matteo was a visiting scholar at the Department of Politics, Science and the Center for Ideas and Society at the University of California Riverside and an academic associate at the Cardiff School of Sports and Health Sciences at the Metropolitan University of Cardiff. Many research fields. Um, I, can, I can mention the process of transformation, translation and transmission of yoga and Buddhism, um, the nexus health and salvation, the discursive study and the politics of scholarly knowledge, production, and social theory. I think it's enough. So uh, we have uh, just an hour. Matteo will speak 40 minutes, and then we shall open the discussion with questions and answers. Uh, you can intervene freely in the discussion. Perhaps you can put uh, your questions in the chat. Or if you want, you can raise your hand, or if you prefer, you can speak directly. Any any way. I, I'm not going to 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 intervene anymore to save time. I shut up now. Um, so let's start. And thank you very much for your attention. So Matteo, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Stefania. Thank you so much, Rafael, and thank you so much, Mar, and to all the present here. Uh, I'm very happy. Uh, to be here and to be part of this network uh, was aim and scope I find uh, extremely exciting and uh, uh, very much uh, speaking directly to, to my research agenda and to the research agenda we share with uh, Stefania. So uh, a quick overview of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we'll start from a few introductory comments exactly aim to understand where we are standing then we're going to zoom into the aim of uh, the presentation. I'm not going to talk more than 30 minutes, I reassure you all. And then we're going to talk about the actual um, object of today's talk, uh, yoga, science and health, uh, providing first an historical overview and then exploring what's uh, uh, the construction of the yoga body uh, that emerges uh, from these uh, uh, in, in interactions between science and health in relation to the practice of yoga. Uh, we'll also briefly uh, talk about the role of the yoga industry in providing particular, par particular politics of the body 
And here I'm drawing on the work of my friend and colleague Emanuela Mangiarotti, whose scholarship is uh, an excellent uh, example of what later I will uh, talk about uh, in terms of social science of yoga. And uh, a brief uh, zoom into the professionaliz professionalization of yoga uh, before posing a question that is quite central to, to uh, my uh, intellectual exploration at the moment. I don't want to sound too pretentious in, in, in saying intellectual. That is uh, uh, the tension between health and and salvation in the contemporary religious and spiritual landscape. And then we're going to bring our today's talk to a conclusion and hopefully have an exciting debate. So let's see if I can move to the next slide. Fantastic. What is yoga? Well, that's a quite ambitious question to pose. I'm not claiming that I will answer. I can tell you, though, what uh, historians so far have been uh, uh, largely um, agreeing on. That is, a yoga has uh, a quite complex history and uh, has been developing across uh, centuries, starting from the tantric and Buddhist uh, ascetic, ascetic milieus of uh, today's Northern India and Pakistan. And by then it was practiced for a plurality of purposes. So this, uh, this is important. Why I'm saying that? Because it's important to understand that health, the center in my ar argument of today's of uh, yoga in the contemporary world, is quite a contemporary addition uh, to the meanings and purposes and possible deployments of the practice. Um, what is uh, important to state also is that I'm not dealing with yoga, accounting for it uh, uh, in its, uh, um, so to say, uh, long history, but I'm focusing on what historians call modern forms of yoga that are forms of yoga that have been developing in the last 150 years at the intersection of a plurality of different social forces such as Western um, or um, occultism, science and medicine, of course, uh, Hindu religions and spirituality, different bodybuilding practices, the anti-colonial struggle uh, of India, um, and so on and so forth. So really, it is a quite dynamic and changing social phenomenon. In particular, uh, as a, an introductory comments, I wanted to share with you that uh, my overall research agenda is uh, focused on the pedagogies of modern forms of yoga. Why is this so? Uh, there is a lack, really, a lack of research into the microsociology of the practice. So there is a tendency in contemporary literature to speak about um, uh, contemporary forms of, uh, forms of yoga, but in general also of contemporary spirituality. Spirituality is a substantially, um, um, how can I say, swallowed into a certain neoliberal logic, right? And uh, I think that many of us do agree with some of these claims and analysis, but I contend that what most of these studies are missing is to show us how yoga, for instance, is emplaced within a deliberate order, and what does this imply at a practice level? That is, how do practitioners interiorize or reproduce dynamics that belong to the broader cultural field? Regarding the fieldwork, I also want to share with you, um, if you like, a biographical remark, which, however, has a quite uh, a, a, an important weight on my scholarship. And that is that I started uh, my uh, inquiries into the world of yoga as a practitioner, first of all, many years ago, over 10 years ago. Um, so I've been personally engaged in the practice, and it's only starting from 2017. Uh, that I started to shift my positioning towards uh, these practices that for many years have been merely constituting uh, for me uh, a spiritual journey, and now they are uh, mostly an object of uh, sociological interest. Uh, here, at the bottom of the slide, you see uh, these uh, three labels, yoga studies, social science of yoga, and health studies of yoga. Basically, I contend these are the three main branches in which current scholarship on yoga uh, is divided. Yoga studies is that field of knowledge that has been developing really in the last 20 years or 30 years, and that have begun, has begun to reconstruct and deconstruct the genealogical roots 
especially of modern forms of yoga, but not exclusively. Uh, again, here the focus is it's quite historical and textual, and it's based on the study of certain lineages. And there is a certain lack of uh, uh, investigation of what the practice and experience of yoga can mean for current practitioners. And that's exactly what the current social science of yoga, which is actually not really a field, it's a collection of disparate efforts from different scholars from all over the world. And personally, I position myself uh, uh, right at the middle of this uh, um, rather heterogeneous body, body of work. And what a social science of yoga try to, tries to do is to study yoga today from a plurality of disciplinary perspective, uh, from sociology to anthropology, and so on and so forth. And there are a few uh, beautiful studies and uh, uh, edited edition uh, that uh, are currently um, being published. That studies on yoga finally uh, are, if you like, the most, the, uh, the, the, they differ the most uh, compared to the other two, which share somehow uh, uh, certain epistemic structures and even uh, tools of analysis, while health studies on yoga really are mostly oriented towards uh, proving the uh, medical efficacy and the scientific legit legitimacy of yoga as an adjunct treatment next to biomedical intervention, or in some cases, even as a self-standing therapeutic intervention. So this is the field where we are moving today. And our aim will be to explore how religious, scientific, and healthist practical discursive logics intersect in the practice of yoga, and more, specif more specifically, how these logics contribute to the social and discursive construction of what we now call uh, somehow in common parlance among scholars, uh, the yoga body. We will say uh, something more about uh, both these aims in the following, uh, hopefully satisfying uh, uh, the questions that I'm posing here. So let's start from a very brief overview. And I must mention that this is largely based on the pioneering work of uh, Joseph Alter and Mark Singleton, among others. Uh, I also want to mention Susan Newcomb. I want to mention Enya Foxen uh, and, of course, Elizabeth de Michelis, among the first authors that have been bringing to light the deep interplay between yoga, between science and health in the evolution of what has come to known as modern yoga. Perhaps one of the most uh, uh, interesting figures is Fa Swami Kuvalayananda. Uh, he was really one of the pioneers into the scientific research on yoga. He started in 1924, if I remember correctly, the publication of the uh, health magazine Yoga Mimamsa. And he has been funding the very famous Kaivali Adamam Health and Yoga Research Center. Uh, apologies for the pronunciation, I always struggle to mention it, uh, which was really uh, among the first scientific center, if not the first scientific center, dedicated to the study of yoga to prove its health and efficacy uh, using the tools of Western medicine. Here in the picture, uh, on the side of, of the names listed here, we see uh, Swami Kuvalayananda measuring and, and taking some parameters from a yoga practitioner's uh, probably showing how meditation or pranayama or asana practices influence heartbeat, uh, stress levels, and so on and so forth. And we know that now this type of research is really uh, perv pervasive and uh, it's quite interesting. I, I say this going a little bit out of track. There is a wonderful book from uh, um, Carolyn Chan, I think she's called, uh, that uh, describes how today in Silicon Valley, uh, exactly practices such as meditation and yoga are used to legitimize um, uh, their deployments and their use by employees uh, on the ground of their scientific legitimacy because uh, they really do uh, enhance performances. So we see that there is a circle from uh, the attempt uh, back in the days to prove uh, yoga scientific uh, value uh, through scientific means to its current deployments in the highest of the uh, neoliberal, neoliberal and capitalistic uh, setting, if you like, that is uh, exactly Silicon Valley. Another important actor, actor is Sri Yogaendra. 
Uh, he was a bodybuilder, interesting. And uh, actually, he founded in 1921 in New York another extremely important uh, health research center called Yoga Institute. And he has been where he has been collaborating uh, extensively with physicians and experts experimenting about the therapeutic uh, impacts and potentials of yoga practice. Uh, they have both uh, contributed enormously to the legitimization of yoga and uh, its uh, scientific standing, if you like. Of course, also Yengar, uh, one of the uh, forefathers of modern yoga and one of the students of who is considered the father of modern postural yoga, that is Krishnamacharya, has been um, considered, if you like, a pioneer of yoga therapeutics. Uh, this is uh, inscribed in his biography, uh, or, or uh, let's say it uh, better, his a geography, which would like a younger to have been a, a very sick and weak guy, a kid really prone to sick, sick, sicknesses of all type, and that overcame these uh, ailments thanks to yoga practice uh, through a series of serendipitous uh, life happenings, uh, Yangar found himself teaching yoga and healing people from it. So it's not a case that then the spread of Yangar yoga, which was massive in the UK, was largely based on uh, health and safety of the practitioners, so quite a therapeutic lexicon and even medical, if you like, rather than on the esoteric dimensions of the teachings that for Yangar himself uh, was quite strong, of course. There are then uh, other actors that are deeply involved in the entanglement of yoga science and health. I mentioned Joka Badzin, which is the founder of the Mindful Based Reduction uh, Program, which has been morphing and expanding and addressing a plurality of different health uh, sicknesses next to uh, stress, for instance, uh, um, cognitive disorder, uh, eating disorder, addiction, and so on and so forth. Uh, the work of the psychiatrist, uh, psychiatrist Bessel van der Kolk, which has been integrated integrating uh, quite a lot of yoga in its uh, holistic approach to trauma. And of course, uh, I'm going to spend a couple of more words to this uh, uh, quite remarkable figure that is Baba Ramdev, uh, guru and entrepreneur, quite a big businessman. He is also a, a, a close uh, figure to the current prime minister uh, Narendra Modi, a Prime Minister of India, of course. He has uh, a TV where he broadcasts his uh, teaching and his pra practices. He sells products of all sorts. Uh, but importantly for our today, Toki has also come under the spotlight because of his uh, claims uh, uh, regarding the medical efficacy of yoga, not only as a preventive measure, measure against COVID, but also as a treatment. Okay, so there, have, there, there has been a court case about it, because, of course, uh, that was quite uh, uh, dangerous to say to the Indian population and to the um, hundred thousand of followers, if not millions, of Baba Ramdev uh, that to not get COVID or not die from it would be enough to do some pranayama. Uh, so th there, there, have been, uh, there has been repercussion about it. Okay, so... Another thing I would like to share with you is uh, mm, this really this snapshot of some of the processes that I contend deeply contributed to strengthen some of the processes that you have been uh, talking about uh, these figures right here. And that is the movement that Andrea Jane, religious study and yoga scholars have been uh, masterfully tracing between the movement of yoga uh, from the counterculture of the 60s to actually mainstream and pop culture today. And of course, it's uh, uh, different uh, positioning first from a spiritual and liberating practices and then to a health and performative practice uh, has really uh, contributed to this shift uh, from the margin to the center of the cultural field and even the economic field, I would like to say. This is interesting because this process has been characterized by uh, 
also what uh, we uh, normally call disenchantment or, or re-enchantment. Uh, what's characteristic are uh, really based on uh, pre holistic premises of health. And so here we see how there is an intermingling, uh, 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 emerging again of another dimension. So it's not simply legitimizing the scientific validity of the practice, but also underlying how uh, it is possible through scientific means to even attempt to legitimize the holistic uh, and the subtle dimension of the practice. We'll talk more about it later. Another important process, and of course these processes are, in, are uh, how to say, are connected and talk to each other, has been the psychologization and the religious uh, exoticism of the contemporary uh, religious field. Here I'm quoting directly from Veronica Altglass, uh, start quote, Exotic religious resources are popularized as authentic and efficient means to manage emotions and attitudes in relation to an increasingly pervasive ideal of self-realization. This ideal, while desired by social actors, also reflects increasingly strong demands of autonomy and flexibility made upon them. Thus, exotic religious resources, along with the re other religious and therapeutic techniques, contribute to the wider trend of the psychologization of contemporary social life. And this again overlap with what uh, uh, Chen uh, um, addresses, ethos of self-optimization, which she um, considers as pretty much the center of uh, today's religious field. Okay, let us, let us now move uh, to uh, a closer focus to the yoga body, and let us do so through these three, three dimensions, practice, teacher, and well-being. Uh, for today, I would like to uh, suggest that we think about yoga practice as a therapeutic technology of the self that changes the practitioner and is productive of the meanings as well as the selves it expresses. This technology uh, therapeutic technologies of the self, of course, is learned and implemented and interiorized and practiced under the expert guidance of yoga teachers, which uh, I um, normally theorize both as spiritual directors for what concerns uh, what remains today of, of the spiritual and religious dynamics in yoga, but most of all as health experts. It's amazing if you get a chance or if you had a chance to attend yoga classes, but especially teacher trainings, to really merge into um, uh, this vibe where teachers are really there uh, to uh, transmit uh, really health knowledge regarding, regarding mind and body, especially. And when it comes to the dimension of well-being, I would like to recall a concept I recently uh, wrote about, and that is spiritualities of the body. Why I bring this in? Because I consider these spiritualities as oriented towards practitioner unmediated relationship with the sacred, despite, of course, there is the mediation and expert guidance of the teacher. And here, the sacred and well-being are both cultivated through work of one's own body. More specifically, uh, spiritualities of the body are all those uh, psychophysical practices with, a, with a, a spiritual matrix, let's say, for instance, yoga, in which the practitioner's body is listening, specific use and modification, as I said just a minute before, uh, through the mediation of experts, are the main tools and methods for accessing the direct and embodied experience of the sacred all the while cultivating well-being. Here it follows an, a note from a yoga teacher where he shares um, uh, some insight that are really helpful for us to uh, understand this interplay. Let's see if I, I, I should do this so I can read. Apologies. Uh, Jonathan says, listening to the body means listening to the sensation caused by the emotion. The body brings us back to naturalness, to feel ourselves, to feel where we are at the beginning, and then to feel more subtle energies, which in the end are finer sensation. What is the most interesting aspect I, I think about this, uh, uh, this uh, quote uh, from uh, this teacher is that uh, there is uh, uh, the, the, the use of, uh, if you like, uh, uh, therapeutic terms such as emotion, uh, finer emotion, but also uh, calling into question 
and mentioning subtle energies, that is the uh, subtle an anatomy of a yogic uh, philosophy and other uh, contempor uh, contemporary and alternative, compl complementary and alternative therapies such as agopuncture. So we see that there is a dia dialogue here uh, also in practitioners' experiences. Uh, I would like now to move uh, to a brief analysis of uh, the yoga industry and its body politics. Here you can see uh, these uh, mm, um, yoga journals cover. And I would like to say that most of the literature that have been taking into account the yoga industry has been focusing on covers. And in uh, the book I'm, I'm supposed to hand into the editor in a couple of weeks, I'm instead providing a content analysis, a discourse analysis of the contents of a selection of articles. So I'm trying to build on the previous scholars, scholarship, but going to look a little bit uh, uh, behind the cover, asking questions such as what is the politics of the yoga body fostered by magazines such as the Yoga Journal? And in what ways the body, when uh, more often than not the female white and performative body, as we can see from these uh, uh, covers becomes the center of attention of various forms of expertise. How do broader processes regarding body management uh, in our contemporary societies affect the representation and social reproduction of practitioners' bodies? What I can tell you from the analysis I've, I've been conducting is that these articles um, are largely written by women for women, and they smooth smoothly uh, juggle between different registers. Uh, often hybridizing them in order to emphasize the importance of the practices and products that the various articles promote. They provide an eclectic mix of healthiest, scientific, and vaguely orientalizing discourses on yoga transformative character, all the while targeting female consumers. The authors of uh, uh, most of the articles is in any yoga journal issue are largely experienced yoga teachers and holistic practitioners and rely, as I just said, on therapeutic, scientific, and also traditional yogic sources, often simultaneously, to offer a serial, series of somatic paths of self-transformation based on practitioner commitment and self-conduct. Building on the work of Mangiarotti, we can say that here, uh, what happens is that the corporeal, the spatial, and the social, and the cultural boundaries, quindi, uh, so I repeat, the corporeal, the, the, the spatial, the social, and the cultural boundaries of the yoga body largely converge and align with the specific politics of the body characterized by neoliberal injunctions about self-care, entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship, and self-transformation. In fact, the concept of politics of the body, in line with the Foucauldian tradition, uh, helps us to understand how the body is a site where power is contested and negotiated, and thus help us uh, to uh, explore source of privilege and marginalization. Okay? So uh, interesting also is the fact that each politics of the body, such the one on the yoga body based on white, female, and performing bodies, is always inscribed between specific body politics, which are basically biopolitical attempts to govern the body of uh, the full citizenship and also of the single citizen. And uh, uh, there is a correspondence in many cases Let's let us think, for instance, of the type of body politics promoted by Modi's uh, administration in India and how they might intersect, diverge, or overlap with specific politics of the body, such as those promoted by the industry. So, before um, going to the conclusion, let us quickly turn to um, the uh, analysis of the prof professionalization of yoga teaching. Why you, do... you have plenty of time, so don't don't wor no worry. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, the professionalization of yoga teaching. Why is this important uh, for our talk today? Is important because here we see how yoga teaching, which in itself is becoming an industry, is deeply enmeshed also with and in the vocabulary of therapeutic culture. Uh, I would like first, though, to introduce the figure of the yogapreneur, building on uh, um, 
Marissa Clark analysis, a wonderful work on the yoga, yogapreneur, where she claims that today yoga teachers are re literally assuming um, the aspect of the entrepreneur in the attempt to promote and make gain and, and, and uh, um, somehow capitalize on their body, emotional, uh, spiritual capital, selling uh, their products, their expertise and guiding practitioner uh, substantially to feel to feel better through through yoga practice. Uh, but there is another concept here that uh, is quite interesting and is the self-work of Antic Utopia uh, advanced by Pages. And she tells us, uh, Michelle Pages, that according to her, the entrepreneur model is not really up to date to explain what drives people professional careers today. On the contrary, she claims the concept of self-work romantic utopia that people want to do things they love. They want to do things that nourish their soul. They want to do things that uh, are integrally uh, part of themselves and align with their deeper self. And that's here where uh, the yogapreneur uh, has to find a vocation to teach and make profit because uh, as the next quote I'm going to read to you underline, uh, yoga is not merely instruction or technical uh, or technical knowledge. Irene, a yoga teacher I interviewed, for instance, underline that teaching yoga is a profession where, in fact, it takes a vocation. The students have to feel you have the vocation. If you inhabit the vocation, you have it in your heart. And if you have it in your, if you have, if you don't have this call towards the other to care inside yourself, your yoga entrepreneur career is simply not going to work. Uh, here is another quote from Beatrice Morello, uh, which is one of the um, most uh, uh, central teachers of the school I uh, study uh, most extensively in my research. And presenting herself in her website, she says, for almost 20 years, I've been following a research path that brought me through different disciplines to deepening and understanding the relationship between body, mind, and emotions. I've been searching for harmony and balance, starting from the work of the body. Again, what uh, Beatrice is telling us is that uh, if you like, her spiritual quest has been deeply influenced by the search for harmony and balance, starting from the work on the body. So there is really this pervasive uh, uh, presence of uh, the health register. Uh, but of course, this type of narratives can be, can be read in many ways, even employing traditional concepts and tools, for instance, from the sociology of religion, such as seeking spirituality, spiritualities of life, the concept of private symbolism from Hanegraaff, the concept of contemporary spirituality, wealth and well-being from uh, Professoressa Palmisano, Prof. Palmisano and Pannofino, the concept of new spiritualities of uh, Geraldine Mossier, for instance. But nonetheless, health remains central to each and every of, uh, one of these concepts that have been tailored to describe contemporary seeking processes. So here have become, uh, here comes, if you like, uh, the big questions of today's talk. And I would be happy if you have thoughts about it because I'm really uh, grappling with it in these days. And that's it. What are we witnessing today when we look at yoga practices? Can we talk about uh, emerging of health and salvation where uh, instances of care of the spirit and care of the body are raised and shaded in particular practices, but are also expression of broader historical and practical uh, discursive uh, uh, processes? Or on the contrary, we are witnessing to a change in the contemporary religious landscape where health is today really the new salvation and the main salvation good that practitioner, practitioners are after. So 
Going towards the conclusion, uh, I would like to uh, share with you the idea uh, that is really in in integral part of the upcoming book I mentioned to you, dedicated to the pedagogies of modern forms of yoga, that the salvation goods that are fostered and searched for on the math do arise, obviously, from the complex interplay and reciprocal influences between situated pedagogical environments, best approach, I claim, to ethnographic methodologies, the discourses and presentation of yoga promoted by the industry, and of course, the broader cultural ethos of neoliberal so so societies with their self-actualizing, performative, and elfist logics. Here we are, a couple of thoughts for our conclusions. Will Croft, which wrote a wonderful book of on what she calls post lineage yoga, that is yoga practices and and uh, and uh, and communities that de develop outside and under margins uh, from traditional uh, lineages, says that the cultural is the cultural stories imparted with the practice have complex roots and carry currents of interpersonal and social political power. Why is this important? It's important because when we practice. When practitioner practice, uh, we are really at the intersection of uh, processes of disciplining of their bodies, mind and soul and social reproduction of specific uh, pedagogical repertoire. But we are also uh, talking about innovation and change. In fact, the transmission of yoga really as any practice does not end in the mere interna internalization of, by students of the te teaching received, but involves transgression, experimentation, emergence of styles of their own, singular autonomous from one of the teacher. And it is in this context that uh, meanings, uh, the meanings of the practice can be multiplied. And I consider that the challenges of uh, the social science of yoga, one of the challenges is to consider the link between the imaginaries and the sensibilities that this uh, plurality of interpretation of yoga um, uh, imply uh, together with the cultural forces that determine the epistemic structure of a given social order. So freedom, yes, but contextualized within specific uh, pedagogical context and within specific um, sociocultural context. Uh, here, let me say a couple of words before uh, opening up to the discussion. And, uh, and that's the following. Uh, I think it would be important to consider yoga as a shape-shifting sociocultural object that we ought to understand in relation to its positioning at the intersection of the fitness and well industry therapeutic culture and the landscape of contemporary spiritualities. And in so doing, uh, I think that uh, the social science of yoga, yoga may contribute to unveil the ambivalences, the changes and the institutional structures inherent in today's yoga industry, which I claim is a hybrid cultural industry that has a particular impact on issues of time and space management, body care, power and authority, social action and interaction, and that really rely, relies on uh, um, healthist scientist and spiritual discursive logics. So thank you so much. Uh, that was my share. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matteo. That was great. Thank you for your presentation, very interesting. So now we have time for questions and answer. Are there any questions? I remind you that you can write, oh yes, there is one, few questions. Okay, if you want, you can intervene freely. Eh? You can write the, your questions in the chat, but if you want to speak, you are very welcome to do this. Uh, okay. okay. Hi. Hi, yes, please. Uh, about the methods. So if I understood correctly, uh, you did 
and uh, how did you say analysis a qualitative analysis of contents in journals is is that what you did but because i understand you also maybe you went to some courses of yoga or you did some interviews i i'm more, i'm curious about the methods you used thank yes. you very much mateo i am uh, not okay. going to intervene Okay, quick uh, so, reply on the methodology of the research. So basically, um, the the research has been an ethnographic research, and it's still uh, somehow uh, in progress because I'm I'm continuing to attend events, uh, classes, I interview people. But so far, I've been uh, uh, conducting fieldwork since 2017, especially in Milan, uh, in a school called Odaka Yoga. I've been interviewed 43 uh, teachers and yoga practitioners and analyzing uh, uh, through this course analysis several um, yoga uh, journal issues. And uh, so, of course, there is a, a plurality of methods uh, uh -huh. that, uh, that I've been employing in my research uh, from micro sociological, if you, if you want, ethnographic uh, uh, first, uh, first, uh, uh, first hand experience of the practice to more discursive to biographical interviews um so i would say this is this is uh, this is the quick uh, answer to your question and perhaps i can reply to the question i see in the chat and thank you Matteo. Uh, you're welcome. The first says, do you think that people may confuse yoga and meditation with religion? And so they refuse. Uh, so that's why they refuse it. Uh, well, th there are some, of course, uh, um, overlaps, although in my experience, uh, it's uh, um, common, more common that uh, uh, Buddhism is confused with the yoga and meditation than yoga itself. Yoga, I think, today is as uh, a kind of uh, cultural imaginary which is quite established of uh, um, per, like fit uh, uh, middle age or young women practicing. So I think today that's pretty much what people think when they are questioned about uh, yoga. But of course, many people, um, well, perhaps I can answer to your first question differently and say that the effort of many yoga preneurs and many of the yoga teacher of the last uh, uh, few decades has been exactly the one of trying to um, uh, sanitize yoga practices from their religious and esoteric contents uh, instead emphasizing uh, the health and safety dimension, the therapeutic aspects, and of course that has greatly con contributed to the idea we have today of yoga, uh, which of course still maintains a, cer a certain um, a spiritual legacy, but is also uh, by now quite medicalized. And regarding the second type of your question, uh, I'm not an health expert in that sense, uh, but uh, there are certainly types of yoga that are more, or practices, like briefing practices or other types of practices that are certainly um, prone to energize you, okay? So if perhaps you have uh, high blood pressure or this type of issue, anxiety, maybe it's better you don't do this type of practices, but do uh, a softer, more relaxing types of practices. So uh, there is uh, uh, a yoga practice for every need, really. And that's what the industry is telling us. And perhaps that's also why yoga is so successful. It's malleable and can really meet the needs of many different people. So I see Mar as a question. Yes, thank you very much for the seminar. It has been great to listen to you. So thank you. It's very thank interesting. You very I have uh, three short questions. The first one is about gender. If you can say something about it, which is a key issue around it. The second um, question is, I'm very interested in this idea of the yoga entrepreneur and also how this fits with a specific work culture and I was thinking about what do you think that is singular of the yoga entrepreneur so within the holistic landscape so what is their singularity in respect for instance Reiki entrepreneurs or um, homeopathic I don't know how so if, if you think about the holistic field and all these kind of uh, new prof 
therapeutic uh, professions there. What would you think that's singular from of, of yoga? No, what what's different from the from the rest or from the classical? I don't know Jane Fonda doing aerobics. So, what what uh, what similarities and what differences do you do you perceive there? And finally, if you can, I'm also a bit intrigued about, and I and I don't know the number, and I don't the numbers, and I don't know if the numbers exist about differences of practices within Europe. So is yoga much more extended in some countries than others? Uh, maybe you don't have information, eh? but just because I'm curious about it. So thank you very much. It's been very very interesting. Okay, thank you so much, Amar, for for your questions regarding gender. Uh, I mean, yoga is uh, a highly gendered field, as we could see from uh, the covers of the yoga journal. There are covers with uh, male practitioners, but they are few. Um, so this is this is this is really a point. And sometimes I ask myself uh, if and how my research would have come out different if I would have been a woman, because of course I'm practicing mostly my informants are mostly women. We share uh, in interview uh, personal stories, they share personal stories, but uh, I'm, I've been thinking in several occasions that perhaps if I would have been a woman, there could have been perhaps another type of uh, connection, connection built there uh, because there would be a, a more subtle mutual understanding of what uh, a yoga means uh, practicing yoga means for uh, a, a, a women body uh, so it's a team and i would like to mention again emanuela mangiarotti which i think it's uh, has been one of the, the scholar theorizing with greater acumen about uh, uh, the gender dimension uh, because she has been capable to merge it together uh, with an analysis of the broader social, economic, and cultural field. And so that's how I'm bringing in gender also in my analysis, um, building on her. So that's a, that's a, a reply, but of course we could, uh, you know, we could have a, a three days conference on yoga and gender, and there is scholarship on yoga and gender, on body image, and I, I know you know it, and uh, uh, yoga and race, of course, uh, uh, where gender, again, is, is another um, dimension of the intersectional approach that is promoted by these studies. Uh, regarding the yogapreneur, wow, your question is uh, difficult. I'm not sure I can answer. Uh, on my two feet, I would say in Italian, su due piedi, um, how the yogapreneur differs from other, uh, let's say, entrepreneur uh, in the holistic field. What are the similarities and the differences? I think uh, um, that perhaps the similarities are uh, the most obvious one, and there is this uh, 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 rhetoric of the authority of ancient tradition, um, as well as uh, uh, a rhetoric of constant update and study and, and continuous learning and training. And perhaps these uh, uh, can be said to be uh, a little bit more specific of the yoga industry, because uh, I think that there are much more uh, yoga uh, teacher certificate uh, training program that certificate that, that other holistic practices uh, but it's something I should look into it more to claim it with more certainty. But I would insist on the dimension of continuous learning and perhaps uh, other aspects could be the extent to which practitioners are actually teaching yoga or teaching Reiki as a primary job or, or known. Uh, I imagine uh, from what I know uh, of the field of uh, holistic care that perhaps it's a bit easier maybe to to uh, teach yoga rather than uh, being a full-time reiki master um but of course it, it depends largely that there are holistic centers where people do live uh, doing uh, agupuncture so it's it's a uh, it's an open question to me and the last question you pose regarding the differences of um frequency of practice in, in yoga in europe i have some data in the book I'm uh, supposed to uh, send in a couple of weeks. Uh, I, if you want, I can have a look uh, while maybe Rafael asks his questions because I don't remember the numbers uh, 
by art, uh, but yeah, th there are there are variations uh, across Europe, absolutely. But uh, the uh, tendency is the same, and the tendency tendency is increase in practice and opening up also to male practitioners. So I think in Italy, if I don't remember uh, wrongly, twenty percent of practitioners are male, which is a lot. And uh, uh, to be honest, that doesn't correspond to my field work where uh, it's five uh, percent really. So, okay, I'll have a look uh, to the to the to the data. And, uh, we, can, and... we can wait a couple of minutes so you can concentrate on what you are looking at. Okay, Rafael, can you wait for a while before? Right. Yeah, thank. You. Thank you. First of all, thank you again, Matteo. It's 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 really refreshing to see like a, a let's say a full detailed uh, uh, um, presentation um, on on yoga and the body. I'm not uh, um, specialized in this field, but I have been encountering some of my in, in some of my research um, the people who practice yoga as a form of medicalization and addressing mental health. And my question was first connected to what Ma already asked about the gender dimension of it, mm -hmm. mostly, for instance, on how, for instance, some of my um, interviewees who are mostly uh, queer, people from the queer community, uh, are turning to yoga in a sort of like a body um, healing sort of field uh, in space. And but this is then connection to connected to another to, to another question. And it's about the digital language of yoga. I think it is not a, co a coincidence that the explosion of yoga is part of being, part of being in, on earth for a long time. The explosion of yoga happened alongside um, internet and, and communication and all that. And considering that is a practice that is so connected to the body and the mind, how this changed the way that these entrepreneurs approach yoga. And I would, I would like to know from you a bit more uh, based on research about this digital digital language of yoga. Thank you so much, Rafael. That's a brilliant question because it allows me actually to uh, expand a little bit on the figure of the yogapreneur um, and the work of uh, Marisa Clark, which developed the concept. So she developed the concept uh, thinking exactly at the gig economy and uh, the online transposition of the teachings, underlining how, uh, due to the COVID uh, lockdown uh, and all uh, it, um, it signified for studios and freedom of movement and so on and so forth, teachers had to increasingly, increasingly rely on online uh, teaching and online promotion. But not every teacher is digital savvy. So there has been an explosion of uh, uh, middlemen, if you like, or yogapreneurs, which have been basically training and teaching to other teachers how to manage their uh, online classes, how to make their Instagram profile more profitable and more uh, appealing. So um, the figure of the yogapreneur is deeply um, related to the online transposition of the yoga teaching due to Corona. But we also have to say that this online transposition is not the consequence of COVID. This has simply been magnified due to COVID, but yoga has been online for quite a while. But what is sure is that now, uh, after COVID, it has been normalized to take classes at a distance, uh, to take teacher trainings at a distance, things that uh, five, six years ago, if they were there, they were extremely marginal. Exactly because what you mentioned, uh, the practice is uh, deeply connected to um, you know, embodied experience and the, the direction of the teachers and so on and so forth. Um, so the online transposition of the teaching is there and has been impacting uh, the ways in which teachers communicate, uh, forcing them to find also new languages during classes, simplifying the instruction, uh, manage the audience through the screen. The communitarian dimensions also have been changing, of course, has been <laughs> fragmenting a bit, uh, as well as the source of authority has been uh, somehow displacing a little bit more the teacher in favor of of the practitioner in a way but uh, here we enter in another discussion um i have the data mar if you want them 
uh, they are actually not uh, only about Europe, they are a little bit uh, more general, uh, but I can tell you that uh, women are the 31% of practitioner in Spain, and India, uh, in Spain and India, in the United Kingdom are 27, in the United States 26, in China 25 in Germany, 21% in France, while men are much, much less. They are 12% in the States, 9% in UK, 7% in Spain, 6% in Germany, 5% in France, 4% in China, with a great exception of uh, India, where uh, there are uh, more male practitioners. So I think these these are the the, the general st statistics I have I have here uh, about Italy. We don't have um, certain numbers. We know that there are about two million practitioners and that there are increasing number of male practitioners, but uh, we don't have uh, detail uh, ro robust statistics uh, data about uh, about that. Please, Valeria. Yes, thank you very much for your presentation. I have a question. Um, so you mentioned that, so as uh, how yoga practice and yoga teachers find, uh, uh, look for scientific le legitimization and uh, use science as reference for their therapeutic claims. Um, I was wondering uh, what science we were referring to. So whether there's, um, whether do you think they talk to uh, mainstream science, or there's a preference toward more alternative science, let's say. Thank you so much, Valeria. This is also a brilliant question because it helps to unpack some things that I didn't unpack in the presentation regarding the ambivalence relationship, really, that uh, yoga teachers, yoga popularizers have towards science in a sense that uh, they do talk to both mainstream science and, uh, if you like, uh, I mean, in a way, science in science, I don't think there can be alternative science in a way, according to the, to the epistemic structure of science. But for sure, what they do is that they... Um, streets an in Italian, how can I say that in English? They uh, come closer also to the lexicon of more uh, alternative readings of science, that for sure. Uh, it's interesting to note that while teachers use scientific claims, mentioning uh, uh, like scientific terms in their narratives, uh, they also a little bit cautious and sometimes they distance themselves from uh, the broader scientific and medical establishment. For example, the case of yoga vaccination, uh, of, sorry, of uh, COVID vaccination is a case in point. I have this concept in mind, uh, which is uh, the concept of yoga spiracy. Yoga spiracy. I haven't uh, written anything about it yet, but it's there uh, marinating. And this would be the idea through which uh, yoga and milieu and yoga environment um, promote those uh, ideas and those values and those uh, and the skept skepticism that is implicit in uh, conspiracy thinking. Uh, in interviews with teacher, I had a taste of this from more uh, of, from more than a single teacher, and I'm talking about established internationally recognized teachers that in a way more subtly and less and less um, uh, uh, and, and less expressively than Baba Ramdev, but basically say, if you do yoga, you'll be fine. Let's not worry. So uh, the, the, the use and the posture towards science and medicine in reality is ambivalent, and it relies on a plurality of sources from biomedicine to psychoanalysis, but especially to uh, the psychological register in general. But of course, also um, uh, movement science uh, and all of the disciplines looking at the functional movement of the body, such as biomechanics, in particular in the school I studied. But the references are, are really plural. Thank you, Matteo. 
Are there any other questions? If we have time, I would like to, to ask a question. Okay, if I understood well, in the conclusion, you spoke of a possible tension between what you call the health salvation nexus and the progressive role of health as a form of salvation. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand very well this point. Yes, mm, this is something I'm grappling at the moment. So perhaps uh, you haven't understood it very well because it's not uh, quite developed yet as an idea, but uh, uh, I'm developing the sense uh, the more I talk with yoga teachers, the more I read the uh, yoga articles, uh, I mean, uh, on the yoga journal and things like that, that really uh, what is at stake, it seems to me, in yoga today, but in the larger spiritual field, uh, it's uh, largely a concern for health. And here it seems to me that health really uh, absorb inside its uh, boundaries all the um, uh, explanatory power, all the signification, all the meanings that people usually would uh, uh, try to find in spiritual or religious practices. So uh, in a way, as if uh, the search for health has become the new uh, seeking process rather than anything else, as if the search for health equates with uh, I found my inner self, I found my balance, I found my harmony, as if health actually is really the center of the uh, holistic milieu, contemporary spirituality, and so on and so forth, and not so much the spiritual. But it's, uh, if you like, a working hypothesis that to me appears uh, more and more evident and, and, uh, and, um, uh, the, the more I, I, I study it, but that, uh, of course, it's a, it's debatable. It's it's a claim. It's an hypothesis. It should be looked into more yeah. and more. Yeah. And it's clear. Thank you, Matteo. Thank you so much. There is uh, another question. No, it's just a comment from Anna. Anna, do you want to intervene? And just another comment from Raphael. So... I don't, I don't know if there are any other questions, so if we can conclude. So, thank you very much, Matteo. That was very interesting, great. Uh, I think my duty is finishes here, so I can uh, leave the floor to Rafael. Thank you very much for hosting us, and thank you to all the members and for your attention. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you, Thank you um, Stefania and Matteo again. Uh, I was just going to end up with a couple of announcements. Uh, the first one is uh, to just encourage everyone to uh, keep following us on our webinar series. Uh, we've got um, very exciting um, presentations for, for throughout the next semester. This semester, our next webinar series, uh, our next webinar is going to be uh, hosted in Brazil by Rodrigo Daniel, the World Health Organization's Production and Enactment of Spirituality, and on the 26th of March. So uh, I'd love to see you there. And lastly, uh, but not least, we've got the registration open, the call for the, our um, summer uh, spring school of science, religion, and health. Um, so I encourage you to um, access our website and see the information uh, that you need to provide, the documentation to provide for registering for the um, spring school. Uh, so again, uh, thank you everyone for coming and um, yeah, uh, see you on our next webinar.